to the average person, it looks like, oh, okay, like, yeah, we're going to ban guns that are typically used in mass shootings. Like, that should be done because we don't, you know, nobody likes to hear that there's a mass shooting. Yeah, right up until you realize that the guns most used in mass shootings are actually handguns. Are handguns, and, yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> so, I try my best to kind of keep abreast of what's going on in the two-way space for every state, but I'm only one guy, there's 50 states. It's kind of hard for me to do that. So um, Ava, I wanted to bring my good friend Ava onto my podcast to talk about what's going on in Colorado right now, because there are a lot of things going on in Colorado and none of them are really good from a two-way gun control law standpoint. And I, I thought it was important for people to be aware of this because I feel like what's going on in Colorado right now is kind of like Colorado's the canary in the coal mine. And so essentially what's what's happening here is inevitably what could start happening across the nation. And so you are in Colorado, you're in Colorado Springs, and you're very closely tied to what's going on there politically. And so just kind of first tell us who you are, and then from there we'll we'll dive into what's going on in Colorado and how people can help fight against this. Sure. So first off, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with what it is that I do, so I've been a firearms instructor for 11 years. I have two podcasts. I have the podcast Gun Funny, which I think I'm going on my seventh year. And then I also have the podcast Pew Pew Panel. Also write for a bunch of various different publications revolving around guns and, uh, you know, gun related topics. And then also an investor of a few gun stores and ranges. And then I didn't say this the last time that I was on your show, which we're going on a few years now, but mm -hmm. um, my dad is Dragon Man. And I kept that a secret for quite some time just because I wanted to make a name for myself and not piggyback off of his name. But for anybody who is not familiar with who he is, he is known by the media as the most armed man in America. And he has a gun store range, military museum, all that stuff in Colorado Springs. Nice, nice, nice. I can definitely say I'm a little jealous of his arsenal, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, I, last time you came to Colorado, I mm -hmm. said that, you know, we could go visit, but. Yeah, I just, I had some insecurities I needed to deal with as far as, yeah. you know, <laughs> my, my tactical armament. Um, so right now in Colorado, the, um, the anti-gunners or the anti-gun lobby, as I like to call them, uh, they're really kind of hitting it hard and they really like Colorado. They're always coming at Colorado and trying to get their things passed through Colorado, because like I said before, canary in a coal mine, right? Um, they figure if they can get things done there, they can probably get things done throughout the rest of the nation for the most part. So w what is one of the most important things that's going on in terms of what they're trying to pass in Colorado right now? So as of this month, as of March, um, I'm not sure when the show's gonna come out, but as of March, mm -hmm. they set out to put, uh, there was 10 different anti-gun bills that we were hit with, mm -hmm. which is a lot of bills to cover in just one month. Um, one of the more serious ones was the quote unquote assault weapons ban bill. And that is not your typical assault weapons ban that we've seen you know, in the 90s. This essentially would, um, this would essentially ban like 80% of semi-automatic pistols, including shotguns and handguns. So it's not just rifles. And I don't know if the, the person who wrote this bill is either a complete idiot or a genius because the language in this is so encompassing that it essentially pertains to so many guns that are on the market now. And so it's not just, you know, again, it's not just like your AR and your AK. This is something that's yeah. going to affect a lot of people. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't really paying attention to it. And then the lawmakers are pretty smart in the fact of like how they label it. So I think the bill is labeled uh, common use guns used in mass, mass shootings or something like that. Mm -hmm. So to the average person, it looks like, oh, okay, like, yeah, we're going to ban guns that are yeah, so. typically used in mass shootings. Like that should be done because we don't, you know, nobody likes to hear that there's a mass shooting. Yeah. Right up until you realize that the guns most used in mass shootings are actually handguns. Are handguns. And, yeah, exactly. And so to your point, you know, that's kind of a brilliant or accidentally dumbass brilliant way of encompassing a wider swath of firearms that you usually used to when it comes to the assault weapons ban. Um, and so you've kind of really taken this issue on pretty, pretty, pretty heart, mm -hmm. heartfully so. 
Um, and, and now, why is that? Because I mean, not, uh, granted, for obvious reasons, you know, you're there, you're you're a five, two way trainer, influencer, all of those things. Um, but what made you? What, what's so different about this particular set of bills um, that made you want to really jump into the fire? Well, I noticed I started getting into politics a little bit last year. I went to the Capitol and testified against a lot of the bills. Same thing, the assault mm-hmm. weapons ban bill, and um, which we were able to fight last year. And the thing is, is like, I'm not very smart when it comes to politics. Like, I don't have an edge on anyone else. I'm just a concerned citizen like a lot of people out there. I think where it really hit me, though, is, you know, when, you know, I've had this family business and um, my dad, you know, he owns Dragon Man's. Him and my mom put it together in the late 80s. And with my mom gone, uh, for those who don't know, she passed away 12 years ago. I feel like, I'm fighting to keep her memory alive and like what she worked hard for. And then I also, I mean, I've created a livelihood around guns. So if they're going to ban all of these guns overnight, like that's going to greatly affect me as well. But then I also, after looking at the bill, I realized like how many other people are going to be affected. And they're essentially trying to ban guns that, you know, have a detachable magazine along with other features such as like a muzzle brake, a threaded barrel, an adjustable stock, barrel shroud, all of these things that really don't make the gun any more lethal. And, you know, and and by uh, choosing like a muzzle brake or let's say a compensator, because they don't really go into detail as to what a muzzle brake is. If you think about uh, like Sig Rose, for example, Sig Rose, they came out with the P365, it has rose gold accents, and it's chambered in 9mm. The 9mm edition has a compensator on it, and by their broad Mm. definitions within this bill, that would ban that gun. And the Sig Rose is, you know, I mean, it's been like getting so many women involved in guns, so many women that typically wouldn't have touched a gun otherwise. And it's, you know, I mean, they're, they're kind of taking over the country with this, which is great. But for all these women that just got their first gun, essentially this ban wants to build that gun. So it's like, it's not just hurting, you know, your average gun owner, it's hurting lots of women or even people that maybe don't have the hand strength or the upper body strength. Now, before you finish watching this video, these are the AKT1 blackout wireless in-ear hearing protection with Bluetooth. I like to call them the AirPods for shooters. I say for shooters because AirPods don't protect your hearing, but these do. They are hands down my favorite in-ear hearing protection that I've ever used, and I mean ever. They have an NR25 dB auto noise blocking. They can enhance your hearing by six times. They have advanced noise cancellation, Bluetooth connectivity with high fidelity speakers so you can take phone calls and listen to music. They have a battery life of 10 hours with an additional 30 hours in a charging case and the low profile and stylish enough to fit in not only at the gun range but in your gym while you're studying working at school at home you name it i'm in love with these things and now they're finally available on my store at shop.mrcoleonnoir.com or you can just click the link in the description section of this video and we all know like muzzle breaks to that degree it helps you know absorb a lot of that recoil. recoil Yeah. So it's it's affecting a lot of people. So I don't feel like, you know, I mean, one, there I do have some, you know, some personal issues with it and I'm sticking up for myself and my family, but I also just feel like I'm sticking up for a lot of gun owners in general that may not know that this affects them. Gotcha. And so let's kind of go down some of the different bills on top of the assault. It's not just the assault weapon ban. There are a bunch of bills mm-hmm. that they're kind of trying to pass through. And so there's um, you have the li- liability insurance aspect of it. Um, so kind of talk yeah. us a little bit, talk to us a little bit about that. So, um, so one thing I, I do want to state is like, I wonder if, you know, cause I've noticed like politicians, they're very tactful mm-hmm. and, um, and as I'm, I'm learning, I'm just like, man, there's just, it's, you know, there's a reason why I think a lot of people don't trust politicians, but, um, I can't help but think that maybe they're directing our attention to the assault weapons bill. And then they're trying to pass all of these other bills oh, while good. we're focused yeah. on that. Yeah, because they are, you know, they are making some some leeway with uh, a lot of these bills. So the liability insurance essentially would make it so that if you are a gun owner, whether you use it for concealed carry, home defense, whatever, if you own a gun, you're required to purchase liability insurance. And that sounds like great in theory to a degree like, okay, if you Mm -hmm. accidentally, you know, 
maybe shot somebody or maybe you, you know, you protected yourself and use your firearm. We're all familiar with like USCCA and like other mm -hmm. additions like that. This is a lot different. Yeah. So for one, I think that this bill is incredibly like it discriminates against those who are less privileged um, because it's an addition, additional cost for one. Gotcha. Yeah. And a lot of people could barely even afford the firearm, let alone, you know, paying for a concealed carry permit. Um, in a, in, and then also, so it'll add the cost, but I also think, you know, anybody who has a firearms related business and you probably have, have ran into this as well, because mm -hmm. you sell like for firearm related merchandise, you probably have had a hard time finding a merchant service or a bank to do business do. with because they are choosing not to do business with anyone who is even touching the firearms industry. I myself have, have gotten, you know, um, dropped by quite a few banks. Uh, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, a lot of these big banks. And so I can't help but think now when you are required to get these this liability insurance, how many companies are going to turn us away and then it's going to create a monopoly and those few companies that will insure us are going to probably charge an arm and a leg. Arm and a leg, yep. And thus kicking out people who are not as financially capable as others and effectively yeah. and, taking away mm -hmm. their right to own a firearm. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of times that's what people fail to realize about this bill. And I think you brought up a good point when you said, you know, maybe they're trying to use the assault weapons ban as a, hey, look over here while we do this over here. Um, and then slowly and incrementally start getting these certain things passed to the point where then at some point they're like, OK, now we can do the assault weapons ban because we got everything else that we wanted. Um, so I think that was an excellent point that you brought up as well. Um, and there's another one that I also kind of have a very. Uh, I have a pretty keen feeling about the, you know, the, the, the securing firearms in a vehicle aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, look, I recently had a situation where someone broke into my car, and they tried to take they tried to take one of my guns, and they weren't able to because I had it secured in the vehicle. At the same time, I've never really been a proponent of forcing people to or mandating people to secure their their guns in a vehicle in a specific type of way. Um, because I think a lot of it is very limiting considering people have different lifestyles and the way they go about things. Do I think you should be responsible in terms of how you keep guns in your vehicle? Absolutely. I just don't think they should yeah. be mandated. So what are some of the yeah. elements in this uh, securing firearms in a vehicle part of the bill as well? So the bill says that you need to have it in some sort of hard case. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also, I think they made an amendment where if it's a long gun, it could be a soft case. But gotcha. I'm with you on that where I'm like, people need to be responsible gun owners. And, you know, typically the guns used in crime, you know, they've been stolen before. Yeah. Um, but that said, who's to say, like, I mean, they were also saying that, you know, you could use one of those little trigger locks or one of those cables or mm -hmm. um, even if it is like a hard case. I mean, any of that stuff, people could break through. And yeah. now there's um, like, uh, what is it called? Um, you know, people like car thefts are at an all time high. Yeah. And so, you know, people, maybe they don't even break in to steal the firearm, but they break in and now they're like, oh, there's a gun in here. And it's not going to take them that much time to break through that cable lock or that trigger lock, or even if it is like a hard lock box, I mean, there's ways around it. So I don't think that yeah. it's really, it's not really avoiding much. Like it's not really solving the problem that we have. Yeah, I, I think for me, so for instance, in my situation, ironically, like my system worked, like they tried to get into it. I literally saw that they tried to get into it and they couldn't and they couldn't take yeah. it because I had I had uh, had my rifle inside of the little vault tech, uh, little vault tech case that I have. And um, so they didn't they didn't just take the case, though. They couldn't take it because I had it. I had it strapped to the my oh, seat of my okay. car with a security cable. Now, keep in That's mind that security cable is not bomb proof, right? As you pointed out, yeah. given enough time, maybe for whatever reasons, they were unable to get it. But if there was more methodical or more thought out, they could probably get some bolt cutters or something like that that could probably get their way into the and take the actual mm -hmm. gun. So then the question becomes, yeah. well, how far do we need to take the security? Right. Because then at that point, if they say, OK, well, it just needs to be in a hard sided or soft sided. And then people are still stealing guns because nothing is indefensible. Right. You could I could have a freaking safe, a real safe in my car and somebody could still possibly get into it. 
Yeah. So then the question becomes, and you, I can see them going this route to the point of saying, well, we tried this. This didn't work. People are still getting their guns stolen. So now we need to make it where it has to be a metal heart sided case. And then people mm -hmm. are still getting through those. So then now it's like, you know what? Nope, you can't keep guns in your car anymore. And if you do, you're going to be held liable. Right. Yeah. So it's that it's yeah. that it's walking that edge and trying to figure out there's a line in terms of being responsible and taking, you know, reasonable measures in terms of to, to secure your firearm. But I don't trust them. And that's why I don't want to mandate it, because I know at a certain point, it's just going to they're going to use it to test. They're going to use the fact that it's inherently not perfect to elevate yeah. to the next step, to the next step and the next step. Um, and so that's no, why absolutely. for me, that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, then, absolutely. Uh, like, it's like you give them an inch and they take a mile. I mean, we've seen this over and over again. You know, I mean, even with like Trump and the bump stock ban, everybody yeah. told them, like, don't do this. It's, do you know, it. it's a really slippery slope. And then now yeah. look what we're dealing with. Yeah. So it's, and, you know, even if something and, does sound like, well, kind of makes sense, you know, it's, yeah. you know. And, and that's the hardest. That's honestly the hardest thing about this, this battle, so to speak, because you and I have been in it for years. We've seen the tactics that they use. We know how they kind of lie and they use soft language and they start here and then go here, give them a minute, take them out, like you said. And with people who haven't been really close to the conversation or the argument, like you pointed out, they look at that, like for instance, Trump. I believe Trump thought, okay, well, let's just be reasonable and say, here, we'll do this and then that'll be it. Yeah. No, we knew better, right? But yeah. to the outside world, to the people in the middle, we look like we're being extreme because mm -hmm. they sound like they're being reasonable. Say, oh, we just want this, but we know it's not gonna stop there. And because they haven't yeah. been involved in the conversation that long, they're just like, they don't know any better. Um, so I thought that yeah. was an excellent point that you brought up there. Um, so now there's another one, it's called prohibiting carrying in sensitive spaces. And for, and for the record, what I'm reading off of is, you know, Ava put together a list of all the bills for me um, to, to, yeah. to read off to you guys so that well, you can keep I wanted, on track I wanted to make on. sure that nothing was missed because I'm like, there are so Absolutely. many. And really, unless you live in the state and you're following, it's you really, won't. it's difficult to yeah. figure out everything that's going on. Yep. And, and I think it's important, like I said, for even people who don't live in Colorado to understand that this is this is just a testing mm -hmm. bed for what they're trying to do across the nation. It's um, literally a blueprint. So I've yeah. told so many people this. They're like, oh, I'm so glad I don't live in Colorado or they're like, whatever, it's time for you to move. So one, it doesn't matter what state you're living in. I mean, even if you're in Texas, even if you're in a very pro to a state yep. at this point, like they are using these laws, these these bills as as blueprints and they're spreading them all over the place to see what sticks essentially it's a disease that is spreading and if we don't conquer it now it is going to spread throughout the united states like i have no no doubt in my mind um as far as like moving i think that that's ridiculous like why am i going to essentially pick everything up and hand over my state on a silver platter like i'm going to yeah. stay here and i'm going to fight and i think that's the problem is a lot of this is you know as much as like gun owners try to be all like you know, like super strong and, you know, alpha and all that, like there's not a lot of people that are actually fighting. And I've seen this with my own eyes. Like when I go to the Capitol to testify against bills, there's some bills in here that will put gun stores out of business. And why not every FFL is not signed up to testify against this, this bill blows my mind. I mean, yeah. it's, it's crazy how many people aren't spreading the word and taking action and trying to fight this. And we've either have gotten incredibly complacent, we think it's not going to happen, or we rely on others to fight the fight. And in my opinion, I think that's very similar to uh, the other side, like when, you know, when people say they don't need a gun, they're like, oh, it's not going to yeah. happen. I'm not going to be in a position where I need my gun. Or if I do need my gun, I'm going to call for help. Like if I needed yeah. to protect myself, I'm going to call for help. And it's funny because we've kind of adopted that mindset where it's, a, it's yeah. either not going to happen or others are going to take care of it and they're going to fight for us. And then even if, you know, people who are, um, uh, you know, um, donating to an organization such as like Firearms Policy Coalition, Gunners of America, um, the NRA, any of these, um, I will say that here in Colorado, like Gunners of America and FPC, they have mm -hmm. not been present at all from a local level. They're doing a really great job fighting for us from a national level and built and bringing up these lawsuits. But if you're relying on these organizations to fight that fight for you, they're not even present. So how does that gotcha. look when, you know, when even these yeah. large organizations that can make a difference aren't even showing up to testify against them? 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. But I also think like just that messaging alone, um, it kind of puts the foot on the neck of some of these organizations so that, I mean, inevitably you make enough noise, they're going to make some changes with respect to that. If enough people make noise as far as the issue in Colorado, I think they would, I would like to think uh, they would step up and um, start paying a little bit more focus or shining a bit of a brighter light, which is why I think what you're doing is important because I think getting as many people involved as possible, it, it, it takes the bullhorn and it makes it a lot bigger and makes it a lot louder. So people are forced to pay attention to it. And then going back yeah. to one of the points that you brought up about people saying, well, it's time to move. What people don't really understand is it's a, it, it, for lack of a better term, it's a slippery slope. And here, here's what's going to happen. Yeah, sure. You could move. Right. But the biggest states, the most, the most highly populated states in this country all have major metropolitan areas in the cities. And these cities are always by far and large ran by Democrats. And we know that Democrats are the people who are pushing gun control. So you could say, oh, let's move. So where, like, where would you move to? Let's say you move somewhere, middle America, where the gun rights are pretty positive. Everything's great. But inevitably, what happened is that everybody starts moving. Then that Col then Colorado becomes a anti-gun haven. And then so now you're in middle America, but then they got that. And then now the people from there in those major cities will start moving out into middle of America. And then mm -hmm. then you'll have a major metropolitan cities take shape there. And then they'll bring in the Democrat ideology and the mindset with respect to being anti-gun. And so then now it's like, OK, well, now they want to bring these gun control laws to that part of middle of America where the gun control laws were actually non-existent for the most part. But now they are. So then now you got to move again. You got to move somewhere else. So they're literally yeah. systematically squeezing you all around the country like toothpaste to the point where there will be nowhere else to go because we like you point out, we just give up the states. Yeah. And so and I'm not so I'm not a fan of the old argument of, well, just move. Um, mm -hmm. It's easier said than done, too, especially if you've you've established a life in this particular state. The whole point of it is to fight. The whole point of the Second Amendment is that when the government actually becomes overly tyrannical, like you actually stand and you fight back against it, whether that be politically, whether that be socially. And if it gets to that point, literally. And so yeah. the idea of saying, oh, we'll just move is bullshit to me. And so it yeah. kind of it kind of pisses me off in a lot of ways when I hear people talk like that, especially in the gun community. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, I yeah, know, it's, I, it's, like, yeah. trust me, it's, it sends me over the edge at this point uh, or there's a lot of people. I was uh, recently I was handing out flyers trying to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, educate people on the assault weapons bill. And I was going to a bunch of gun stores and even like one guy in particular behind the gun store or behind the counter. He was just like, oh, yeah, that's going on. He's like, well, I hope you all beat it. Like, what do you mean, y'all? And like, am I, so I'm alone in this, even though you work yeah. at a gun store and if this passes, your job is basically going to, I mean, we saw we saw what happened in Washington. Like yeah. the assault weapons bill has decimated gun stores. And that's, it just like, it irks me that people are, I mean, they're choosing to put their head in the sand or sit on their hands and they're not doing anything. And it's really unfair for the few people that are fighting because honestly, like I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not a lobbyist. I am not sponsored by some, you know, some pro gun That's organization. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm doing this, spending my time, and I'm so behind on my work. But I'm doing this because I just feel very passionate about it. But like, it's not fair to put this all on, you know, the very few that are fighting like on their shoulders. Yeah. So now, with, with that being said, you know, let's say I'm somebody who's in Colorado. Um, mm -hmm. Hell, not even just Colorado, but somebody who's in just a concerned citizen. Um, they don't have a major platform like you and I do, but they they want to fight. They just don't know what to do. So, like, what would okay. what would be a route they could take to fight back against these potential bills? So, I would say um, we need all hands on deck. So, if there's any like whether you live in Colorado or not, you can still mm -hmm. contact these representatives. I put on my website on gunfunny.com. It's on the homepage. If you click contact the representatives, I put together, well, my editor put together a list of all of the potential uh, representatives, senators and stuff that will potentially vote on this if it gets passed. If it, yeah. it's uh, right now, it's going through the house floor. Um, but I'm trying to make as much noise now so that they know that you know, that like if they touch this, the chance of them getting reelected are going to be very slim. So if we make noise now and it doesn't even get to the part where, you know, where it reaches the Senate, that's great. 
So I'm trying to get, you know, people to email, call, um, all of this has to be documented. So they probably aren't going to read your email and the voicemail that you leave, they'll probably skim through it. It doesn't matter, but they still have to document whether you are for or against it and still let the representatives know. So that's something that people can do. In addition to that, people need to pay attention to who they're voting for locally. I am guilty of this. I used to pay attention to presidential elections and not really pay too much attention at a local level. And this is how we are outnumbered. Like we are so outnumbered um, at the Capitol from Democrats to Republicans that even if, I mean, we really, we really don't stand much of a chance. I'm surprised that there aren't more things that are getting passed. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say really pay attention and I'm going to be extremely vocal as to everyone who's running and you know who people should be voting for. If they don't want to do the footwork, I'll do it for them. But I would also look into organizations um, or people like myself that are willing to do that footwork if you're not sure who to vote for, because this is incredibly important. Good, great. Yeah, I, I think I, I do want to push back on one thing you said. Um, yeah. I, I do think it is the case that most people do think like if you send send letters, leave voicemails, emails and things like that, that they won't read them. Um, I kind of have that mindset too, but I but I think people will be surprised. I think sometimes yeah. things do get through. Like I didn't know until recently that a lot of people in Congress who are on our side, they they watch my videos and utilize my arguments in Congress and and how they go about those things. Because the one thing I will say is when you are a politician, when you're in whether you're in the House or you're in the Senate, you're on state local level, you have a lot of issues that you have to contend with. And it's not always the case that they can be an expert on these issues. Even me, when I look at read certain comments on certain videos that I do and things like that, people will bring up arguments and perspectives I didn't even think about. Yeah. And so and I can. And so that what that does is we almost kind of we can use that to help reinforce ourselves and make ourselves stronger from that perspective in terms of the argument's sake. So um, as much as I do agree with you from the standpoint that they may not read all of the, the letters or the emails that come in. Um, don't just half-ass it and say, well, they're not going to read yeah. it, so I'm just going to put one line and do that. Because I think you may be surprised. Um, and in a lot of ways, if they if, it, if that message does get through, sometimes, like I didn't know that there are people in the ATF who are actually big fans of mine. Now, yeah. are, they sitting at, uh, they sit, are they sitting at the higher level of the ATF making those decisions? No. But you got to remember that you, we do have allies in some of these, these institutes that we think are incredibly anti-gun. Um, so I'm just running off at the mouth to say, take take what Ava is 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 encouraging everybody to do, not only in Colorado, but I think nationwide. Everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 reach out to your representatives because a lot of times they may not, they're so busy, they may not even realize that this is a big deal to a lot of us. And they may yeah. think that they can just kind of gloss over it and say, okay, oh well, man, nobody really cares about it. So, you know, here, do whatever you want. I got so many other things I have to focus on. Um, so I thought, I thought that was a great point, but I did want to push back just a little no, bit. That's, and so, that actually is a good point. And, and yeah. you don't, the last thing you want is for them to actually read it. And then you sound like an idiot. And then it's like, not a good look for gun owners. So I totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also I do want to specify too, if anybody is like, I just don't have time to testify, which it's hard. It, I mean, yeah. the assault weapons ban bill. So 600 people signed up to testify against that, which honestly, mm. those numbers, that sounds like a lot. It's really not especially yeah, yeah. when gun owners make up almost 50% of Colorado. So there should have been way more than 600 people. But that said, um, they cut it off after 12 hours. If people don't want to show up and sit there for 12 hours, which I understand is a pain, you could also testify remotely. And then in addition to that, you could also write a letter. Um, so you can, you can uh, testify via letter Again, they may or may not read it, but it still has to be documented. And then let's say it does go to the Senate, all of that, like who wrote in and who testified against what, they're going to see that. And I think that it is going to weigh in on their decision because I feel incredibly, um, I mean, I, I do feel very strongly that there's power in numbers. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, even the other day I testified against two bills, People who were uh, against this bill, against both these bills, uh, greatly outnumbered those in favor of it, and they still passed it, which pissed me off. But <laughs> at the same time, it was only 60 people who signed up for both bills to testify in total. 
Imagine if there were 6,000 people that signed up. I think then these these representatives would maybe rethink their decision, whereas like 60 people isn't going to make or break their reelection. And that's ultimately where we have to go after them with is they all want to get reelected. And majority of them that are in Colorado are up for reelection this year. Gotcha. Yep. And I think that's a great point. I think a lot of people underestimate how much these people fear losing their seats. Um, yeah. And, and I think there's something said about putting them in a panic mode where they get enough feedback from people who are upset about it that they're like, you know, uh, we don't want to touch this. Even if even if it's not a vote against the gun control laws, them not wanting to touch it is good enough. Absolutely. And I, and I think people need to understand that as well. Um, yeah. Real quick before we go. I want to talk about the gun culture in Colorado as is, because a lot of people don't really understand what the gun culture is like in Colorado and why I say that Colorado is kind of a test bed. Um, and you've, you've echoed the same sentiment because Colorado is there's, there's, there's a lot of guns in Colorado, <laughs> you know, so and a lot of people think, oh, well, well Colorado is just anti gun inherently. And it's like, yeah, they're a little liberal, but there are a lot of people. Colorado is Colorado is not a small state. Um, so there are a lot of people in Colorado who do have a lot of guns. So what is the gun culture like in Colorado from your viewpoint and your experience? Uh, I mean, it depends on where you're at. So like Colorado Springs, yeah. very pro gun. You know, if you go up mm -hmm. to Denver, hit or miss Boulder, pretty anti gun. Um, yeah. but I, I'd say for the most part, Colorado is, you know, I mean, it used to be red. That's the thing. It's like, you know, yeah. Colorado used to be extremely red, then it turned purple. Now it's blue, but it's like barely like still borderline blue. And yeah. you have lots of military bases around, like in Colorado Springs. Um, I looked up to see, I was like, okay, what percentage of the population in Colorado owns guns? And it was in the high four, like 40%. Okay. So it's, it's still like, that's why it kind of blows my mind. But the problem is, is like people just aren't getting active. And yeah. there's so many ways to do it. And I get it. Like I, if anything, I should be the perfect example. I don't understand politics. I have asked so many questions. Any of my political friends are probably like tired of hearing from me at this point because I'm like, well, what does this mean? And well, what's the next step? But, you know, find people or organizations that you trust that you could ask them questions that are going to keep you notified and, and learn along with me. Um, because I think the last thing, the worst thing that we could do is just like not do anything. And that is not what is ingrained as gun owners. We were, we are not, we're not, you know, here to think that like, that's not our, our, our whole mentality. Like yeah. our whole thing is like, you know, we take safety and everything into our own hands. So why is it that people are so complacent now? And, oh, and oh. then also one thing that I want to go through real quick, cause I know you're going to cut mm -hmm. me off, but it's important that I go over some of these on other bills. <laughs> I know. I'm like, no, I have no, your go attention. Ahead. No, I, I sorry. Have, I didn't realize, I, I didn't realize there were more. I didn't know there were more. There's so many no. more. There's, I said oh, there's, there's like 10. The stage is yours. The stage is yours. But I just want, I just, it's important that everybody knows what's mm -hmm. going on and just like the kind of crap that they're trying to pull. Okay. So like um, the safe spaces bill, they're trying to make it so that places that could potentially, you know, have like a mass shooting, like parks and stuff, um, that people shouldn't even be able to conceal carry. Uh, there is also the 11% tax. They want to mm. increase taxes by 11% if you purchase guns or ammo. Again, mm. a very privileged, um, a very privileged law because you and I, we do fairly well for ourselves. Like, you know, mm. I mean, it's going to suck to spend like to have a 11% increase, but at the end of the day, it's I'm not going to make or break us. Whereas like yeah. some of these people that, okay, now they have to buy, you know, get a concealed carry permit because even though there's 29 States now that have a uh, constitutional carry, Colorado is actually going backwards. They also are trying to pass a law that uh, you need to now get training, not only from a firearms instructor, but also somebody who is, run by CBI, CBI, which is Colorado Bureau of Investigation. So they're trying mm. to actually increase standards. Increase it and make it harder. But gotcha. that 11% that tax, so they can't just increase taxes uh, like by voting on it, but it is mm. going to be on the ballot. And I really hope that people vote against it. But again, you know, it's, it just depends how, they, how they're going to word it because to the average okay. person, they're like, well, you know, like, they probably should. Maybe that will stop Make it a little from bit so yeah. many. Whereas, like, in my opinion, I mean, they're creating guns in self-defense as like a sin tax. Yeah. You know, our I mean, that's right absolutely what it is. Is not a sin. Yeah. We're not we're not smoking I'm, cigarettes here. Like, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, but according to them, I mean, I wouldn't be. 
so many of them, they think it's actually worse. Um, and so I think, I think that's a good point to bring up as far as people being so gullible as to hear the language of the law and then think, oh, well, I mean, it's not that bad. Of course, we want more people to get more training so that yeah. we have more responsible gun owners out there. And to a degree, I, I agree with that. You should get as much training as possible. But once but again, it's not just, the government's I, place. It's not because we all no. know what the government is really trying to do was just make it make the barrier of entry so high that it <clears throat> but it basically bans your ability to own a firearm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then they also just recently passed, and I think unfortunately this is going to go into law, uh, mm -hmm. merchant codes, merchant. Um, oh, yeah, codes I did like hear about that. So if you purchase a firearm or ammunition, there's going mm -hmm. to be a certain credit card code that appears. And in a way, this could be a type of registry so that they know, okay, you bought a gun. Um, if you are buying too many and this code continues to reappear, you get flagged. I mean, it's just one of those things where it's it's an invasion of privacy. But also yeah. what I don't like is it's going after the mom pop shops because the bigger stores like Shields, Cabela's, all of that, because they sell so many other things other than guns and yeah, ammo, so. they're not getting that code. Yeah. And then mm. again, it kind of goes I didn't even that realize that. Privilege. Yeah, it goes along the whole privilege thing where you and I, all right, whatever, like we don't want to be, you know, flagged with that code. We'll pay cash. Yeah. But the average person is not going to be able to afford a gun and pay cash with it because they're expensive. I mean, anything decent is going to be about $400. Exactly. And that's Easily. a lot for some people. And, and that's just a gun. We haven't talked about the ammo. Yeah. We haven't talked about the accessories that they might need to get for the gun as well. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. buying a gun is not a cheap endeavor by any stretch of the imagination. No. So, uh, and then they also just recently passed, and I think this unfortunately is also going to become bill, a bill, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, or a law, I'm sorry, is um, they essentially are increasing um, the, the uh, like what firearm stores have to do. So it's, it's literally the, it's a redundant. It's the exact replica of what people, what FFLs already do for, mm -hmm. you know, ATF in order to get their federal firearms license. So they have to do an interview. They have to show where the guns are secured. They have to make sure that people who are working for them you know, pass a background check, like all of this stuff that is already things that we're following now, but instead they've come out with another bill that's incredibly redundant where now CBI is joining ATF and they can do the same thing that ATF is already doing, but then they're also charging us an additional fee for this. And I think that, you know, if anything, because they can flag you at any point, this is a mm -hmm. way to come after a lot of those gun businesses that have been speaking up. Yep. So it's, I mean, they're just essentially they're trying to come out of like at us at all different angles and they're getting really smart about it. Like if they're like, all right, if we can't make laws, we're going to come at them from the credit card angle. If, you know, if they are going to have a gun, we're going to make sure that they can't carry it. And if they if they go against that law, then, you know, they're we're going to gonna... uh, hit them with a really big fine. And also for anybody who is saying like they're just not going to comply. Cool. That sounds great in theory. Um, initially, the assault weapons ban, the first the first offense, the first time that you would, uh, you know, disobey this law, you would get hit. They changed it, but you would have gotten hit with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine, hmm. which is going to cripple a lot of people. So even a if you're like, I'm not going to comply. So what you're going to lose, like your house, your car, your livelihood, because you decided not to comply. And now you owe, you know, you have to pay this fee that you're refusing to pay. Yeah, I think I think people underestimate the process in terms of like you, you want to be able to fight through the system as much as you can, mm -hmm. because nobody wants to get to the ultimate point. And granted, no. it's there and we can utilize it and will. But we're not at the point where it's a complete loss. And I think a lot of people seemingly think that way. But we're on defense. We're playing defense. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. the drawback of being on defense is you never really get a break. No, it's constant because they can attack anytime they want. So we have to defend the Second Amendment because it exists. It's like a castle, right? It's immovable. Um, so but because it's immovable, people can constantly attack it. And as a result of that, we're constantly going to have to defend it. And I think people think that they can just throw a couple of punches and jabs and then sit down and not have to worry about it and just relax. It's like, no, yeah. we don't we don't get that benefit. We are stuck constantly fighting. This is an ongoing fight and it'll always be that way. Yeah. But it's worth noting anything worth having is worth fighting for. Fighting for.
Touche, touche, my dear. Sorry. Now, is there anything else I missed? Because the last thing I would want is for you to get mad at me because I didn't, I didn't, we didn't exhaust everything you wanted to talk about, which I think is I mean, important. That's, that's which essentially is what, the gist of it. Um, right. But I'd say, you know, guys, pay attention to what's going on in your state because uh, most most gun owners in Colorado, after talking to them, they have no idea that all this other stuff is going on. And yeah. and again, be active. I know it's extremely discouraging, especially when you go to testify. And, you know, we outnumber people who are opposed against these bills, like outnumber those in favor. And you're like, how could they still pass it? But again, we need more people. There's power in numbers, 60 people, 600 people, like that's not cutting it. It helps, yeah. but like we need to come together because there's so many gun owners out there that we are going to outnumber all of these people who want to take our guns. So if anything, Absolutely. we just, we need to, we need to come together more than anything. Yeah. And fight this. And I because I can assure you, the other side is well organized. Yeah. Well organized. Um, and, and, and they're very strategic. So I absolutely agree with you there. Yeah. Well, I'm um, kind of scared. And then I'm, I'm uh, not... if anybody else wants to keep, I guess, up to date with what's going on in Colorado, you guys could mm -hmm. follow me on social media. Um, I've been posting a lot of stuff, uh, lots of stuff in my stories, like when these bills are going to be heard. Another really great resource is like Rally for Your Rights. Um, mm -hmm. Leslie Hollywood does a great job of like, you know, keeping up to date with all of the bills and what the next step is and, you know, when we can testify against it. And, uh, and there's links as well for that too. And if you guys aren't sure of how to sign up to testify, because that's a confusing in itself. I don't yeah. know if you've ever signed up to testify against a bill, but you're like, okay, so now you have to figure out what committee it's taking place, figure out that bill number, that time. And it's like, by the time you're dealt with that, if you don't really know what you're doing, yeah. that in itself yeah. is like extremely intim intimidating. I so, think that's um, purpose. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like, none of yeah. this is supposed to be easy. And yeah. they don't want you to be, you know, they don't want it to yeah. be easy. So. Um, but I would just I would just Google, you know, how to testify in Colorado, how to testify in Minnesota, any of that. Absolutely. Well, um, let me see if there's anything else I think we might have missed. I think. But I mean, hey, I mean, you're always welcome to come back on if anything else pops up. So. <laughs> I'll be like, OK, listen, mm -hmm. one more thing. I was sleep I was trying to sleep last night and I thought of another thing. No, I do appreciate you having me on um, one thing I do. One last thing I want to say. So if you guys are looking mm -hmm. for me on social media, on Instagram, I'm extremely shadow banned. So you have to put in Ava Flannell. So A-V-A, -A, F as in Frank, L-A-N-E-L-L -L underscore. And it's the only account that has a picture. And you should not have to request to add me. And then I'm also on Facebook and YouTube and all of that other good stuff as well. So, um, but oh, I do so appreciate you, you having me pages. on. Huh? So, so you got people making fake pages of you. Yeah, you know. It happens. <laughs> yeah, touche. All right, go ahead. What you about to say? Oh, well, I was going to say, and the next time you're in Colorado, I'll have to show you my dad's place. Because um, it's been a little while since we've gotten together. Yeah, I'll tell you about two years. Yeah, I know. Years, like, yeah. I don't, you know, and you don't go to events anymore. I mean, I've gotten picky as to, like, what events I go to. I, I go to events. What? I do. All right. Sometimes. Well, you're just in the you're just hiding, but I'm we'll have to make plans to get together and, uh, yes, and hang out, whether it's in Texas, California or California, Colorado or somewhere else. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> California. Enough. I mean, I'm, I'm long. I'm long overdue for a Colorado visit. So and yeah. there is a hotel I love down there in Denver that I like to stay at. So. All right. We'll I, I will. Plan it. Yes, ma'am. And then bring Peter to film all the all the fun of taking me out in the wilderness and seeing me uncomfortable. Oh, my gosh. That's. I mean, that might be a story for another day, but yes, I did that. I brought Peter and I don't know if everybody knows your real name. Um, you, you didn't bring Peter. I brought Peter. Okay. Well, you brought him from yeah, world support. I brought Peter. Peter yeah. and I were having a blast. We're in the mountains. Because all are a bunch uh, of weirdos. I showed you, you know, this like really cool, like waterfall feature and uh, Peter's using his drone and got all this like really cool. That was like, pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, Colorado yeah, is a beautiful state. That's another reason why I'm will. like, I'm not moving. Like I, yeah. I have roots here. My parents' business have, has been here since the '80s. Like, I'm not moving. I will yeah. fight. No, Colorado is Colorado is a beautiful state. So I'll give you that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to say I'm like Texas, but I'm not going to diss te- Texas. Like I know with that, we are going to end this conversation because <laughs> I'm not going to let you deride. No, I'm playing with you. But no, no. Um, thank you for coming on and, um, and spreading that information. I think it's incredibly important. Um, like I said before, you're always welcome to come on the podcast. And uh, we'll keep fighting this thing as best we can. All right. Thank you, guys. Guns aren't political. That's why I need your help getting this message to spread on YouTube by clicking the thumbs up button, leaving a comment to let me know what you think of the video, then subscribing to the channel. But most importantly, click that bell symbol. For products featured in this video, click the links in the description.